In this video, you will learn to implement automatic braking or obstacle detection for your autonomous car. You can see I have my car here, and if I turn it on, it is just programmed to drive forward. However, if I put my hand in front of the car, it will stop automatically. Just like you would want a real autonomous car to slam on the brakes if a pedestrian ran into the road or another car ran a red light, you want your autonomous car to be able to react to obstacles in front of it so it doesn't crash. You will do this by combining two things you've learned in previous videos. First, you learned how to control your car's motors using a chip called an H-bridge. This allows you to interface the motors with the Arduino while powering them with an external battery pack. You need to do this because the motors require too much current to power them directly from the Arduino's pins. The H-Bridge allows you to independently control the speed and direction of each motor, and that lets you program behaviors like driving forward and backward and turning left and right. However, that only lets you hard-code certain behaviors or pre-program a path. Your car won't react to the environment. To do that, you need a sensor. In a previous video, you learned how to use the ultrasonic distance sensor. It emits bursts of ultrasonic sound and measures how long they take to reflect back to the sensor. Based on that, you can calculate the distance to the object using the speed of sound. In that video, you just use the sensor to light up an LED. But in this lesson, you will make the motors react to the sensor. Now, as you can see, this is where you have to be careful because your circuit has lots of wires and can start to get messy. It is very useful to use color coding. Again, we usually use red for power and black for ground. But then for the other colors, you can pick whatever works for you. For example, I have used orange wires here for all of my motor direction control pins and blue wires for the speed control pins just to help me keep track of what is what. You also want to make wires as short as possible on the breadboard because that will help keep things neat. These longer wires are convenient for connecting to the Arduino, but as you can see, then they tend to get kind of loopy and messy, which can make your circuit harder to debug. So if you have some wires misplaced on the breadboard, it will prevent your circuit from working. You are going to need to carefully go through and check each connection on your breadboard because this is a complicated circuit and you have to have everything built right for it to work. Remember that there is a troubleshooting video earlier in this series. You can also refer back to that if you are having trouble debugging your circuit. Another option, especially for the longer wires coming from the sensor, is to use twist ties or tape to bundle them together, and that will make things a little less messy and make it easier to keep track of your circuit. Let's switch over to Tinkercad and take a look at the two previous circuits separately before we work on merging them. We're not even going to worry about the code yet, we're just going to look at the wiring. So here we have the hcsr 4 ultrasonic sensor, which has four pins, power, trigger, echo, and ground. You need to use male, female jumper wires to connect the sensor to your breadboard, although you can also just plug those wires directly into the Arduino. We're not going to be using the LED in this video, so you can ignore that. Next, if we switch over to the H-Bridge, this one has a lot of connections. The H-Bridge has 16 pins. So each motor has two wires that go to the H-Bridge, and each motor is then controlled by three wires that go to the Arduino two for direction and one for speed. The H-Bridge also has additional connections to power and ground. It is also very important to remember that you have an external battery pack powering the motors, and while you do want a common ground, so the negative or black wire from the battery pack should be connected to the breadboard ground bus, which is connected to the Arduino, you do not want to short circuit the positive wire from the battery pack to the positive five volts from the Arduino, because those are two different voltages. So you see, I am using my positive or power buses separately here, but they are not connected by a jumper wire, whereas the ground bus is connected by a jumper wire on both sides. Now, depending on what you have built from previous videos, you will now need to merge these two circuits. If you already have your car built with the H-Bridge circuit, then the easiest thing to do is just to leave the H-Bridge in place on the breadboard since it has so many connections, and add the ultrasonic sensor working around the H-Bridge. So it's important to remember how a breadboard works. It is not critical to use exactly the same rows and holes that I have used in this video. So for example, you see here I have the ultrasonic sensor in rows 12, 13, 14, and 15, but those rows are taken up in the H-Bridge circuit here, 
that is fine. I could just choose different rows. For example, I could put the four wires from the ultrasonic sensor down here in rows 20 through 23, and then run jumper wires to the Arduino. So depending on how exactly you built things, you will need to now connect everything on your breadboard. You can pause the video here or go back to either of the two screens. You can pause here if you need to rewire the H-bridge circuit, or you can pause here if you need to remember how to connect the ultrasonic sensor. But ultimately, you want to have both of these circuits connected on your Arduino. You also need to, again, be careful about how you have your buses wired. So you see here in this ultrasonic sensor part of the video, I have five volts from the Arduino going to the left-hand side power bus here. But in the part with the H-bridge, I have five volts from the Arduino going over to the right-hand power bus, and the six volts from the battery is going to the left-hand power bus. So again, you don't want to short those two voltages together. You need to decide which bus you are using for which voltage. So again, pause the video here. We're not even going to worry about the code yet, but just connect, try to connect both of these circuits on the breadboard. And then if you have trouble doing that, after the pause, I will show you how I wired it. So here is how I wired the circuit in Tinkercad. Again, I just kept the H-bridge in place and added the sensor wires in a different location on the breadboard. So I have the trigger and echo pins going to rows in the breadboard and then separate jumper wires going over to the Arduino. And in Tinkercad here, I decided to just run the power and ground wires directly to the power and ground buses here. Depending on how you have wires arranged on your physical car, you might not want to do that. So it might be better to have the long male-female jumper wires from the sensor all go to the same place on the breadboard, in which case you would have what I showed earlier. Power wire goes down there, ground wire goes here, and then I would need to use additional jumper wires, again, being careful to make sure I take the power wire to the correct voltage. So in this case, I have five volts over here on the right side, so I would need another jumper wire over to that bus, and then the ground wire can go to either side because those are connected, so I could do a jumper wire here, I have to move this wire out of the way. I could do a ground jumper wire to this bus. That is a matter of choice. You don't have to put things exactly where I have them in this video, video. As long as you understand how a breadboard works, if you prefer to organize things differently, you can put the connections in different places. Again, as long as they are all ultimately connected to the right pins. Also, with your physical car, you probably won't have the same layout that I have here in Tinkercad. Your sensor is probably going to be over here in front of the Arduino. Like I showed it earlier, that just gets kind of messy in Tinkercad with routing the wires all over the place. So in Tinkercad, I've placed the sensor up here, but again, with your physical car, you're going to have to account for the physical location of all of these parts. The same thing goes for the motors. They aren't really behind the breadboard here. They are both going to be under the chassis of your robot on either side of the breadboard. But in Tinkercad, I've just laid the parts out in a way that makes sense so we can see all the wires. Now that you have your circuit assembled, let's go back and take a look at the code and a refresher of how these circuits work. Remember, if you want the complete explanation, you're going to need to go back and watch the full videos that are dedicated to the sensor and the H-bridge. Here, we're just going to do a quick refresher so you can make them work together. So with the ultrasonic sensor, we have a program here that measures the distance to the object in front of the sensor. In Tinkercad, you can simulate that by clicking on the sensor and dragging this little imaginary ball around. And we wrote a program that turns on this LED when the object is closer than a certain distance to the sensor. You can read through the comment and code and see that we define a bunch of pins. Then we set those pins as inputs and outputs. And then there is some code that sends a trigger pulse to the sensor. Then we measure the return pulse with something called the pulse in command. We convert that to a value in centimeters. And then we have an if statement to turn the LED on if the measure distance is less than some threshold that we define. Again, that was kind of a very quick overview here. If you go back to the video about the ultrasonic sensor, we walk through that in much more detail. Then for the H-bridge circuit, we have a bunch of pins that control the motors. Again, there are two direction pins and one speed pin for each motor. We set all of those pins as outputs, and then we wrote a bunch of functions for different behaviors like driving forward, driving backward, turning, or stopping. Each one of those functions has a bunch of digital write commands to set the pins to the appropriate values. And if you would also like to control the motor's speed instead of having it run full speed, we also have these analog write commands. We can then call those functions from our loop 
to hard code certain behavior. For example, this would just alternate between driving forward full speed for two seconds and then driving forward at roughly half speed for one second. And again, that is a quick overview. If you would like the longer, more detailed explanation, you can go back to the video about steering with two motors and the H-bridge. So now that we've finished that overview, here is your programming challenge. In addition to combining the circuits, you also need to combine the code. You want to change your car's behavior so instead of just driving forward forever, it will automatically stop if it detects an obstacle. I am going to leave that as a very open-ended challenge for now, so you can pause the video here, give it a shot, then after the pause I will give you some hints if you are still having trouble, and then finally we will go over the complete code. Now, if you're having trouble doing that, here are some hints, and you don't have to worry too much because you're not really writing a lot of new code here. Most of it will involve copying and pasting sections of code from your sensor program and merging them into your HBridge program. Again, I recommend doing it that way because just like with the circuit, the HBridge program is longer and a little more complicated, so it is easier to take some of the shorter sensor program and paste the relevant sections into the motor program. So you will need to define all the variables you need to use your sensor, just like you have the pins for your motor control declared up at the top. In your setup function, you will need to set modes for those sensor pins. In the loop function, you will need the code to take a reading from the sensor. And then the trickiest part is using an if statement to compare the sensor reading to that threshold value and either drive forward or stop. Again, if the actual reading is less than the threshold, you want to make sure you stop so you don't crash into the obstacle. But that code is very similar to the code you would use to turn an LED on or off. The difference is that in this case, instead of using a single digital write command for an LED, you would be calling your functions for driving forward and stopping. So again, if you had some trouble, pause the video here, think about those hints, and see if you can write the program yourself before I show you some working code. Okay, now let's take a look at my working example code. So just like I mentioned, we already had the variables declared for the motor control pins, but I have also declared several different variables for the sensor pins and the variables we're going to use with the sensor. That code is just directly copied and pasted from the sensor program. Then going down farther in the setup function, we also have to declare some pin modes for our sensor pins. Again, those lines are just copy and pasted from the sensor program. And in our loop function, we are going to generate that trigger pulse and then take a sensor reading using the pulse in command. And again, this section of code is just copied directly from the sensor program. The only different thing you could do here, if you wish, is to put this code inside a function just like we did with all of the driving commands. So that would help keep your loop a little neater. And for example, you could just have a single function that's something like centimeters equals take sensor reading or whatever you would want to call it. And then you would move all of this code down inside that function. But I'm not going to do that for now. I'm just keeping this code inside the loop function as it is. And then here's the important part. We have our if else statement. So we say if the measured centimeter value is less than the threshold value that we've defined, that means we're too close to an obstacle. So we're going to stop driving. Else, if that centimeter value is greater than the threshold, then there's nothing close in front of us, so we are going to just keep driving forward. And again, this if statement is nearly identical to the one from the sensor program that controls an LED. The difference is that here we were just using digital write to control a single pin, and here we are calling the stop driving and drive forward functions. If I run this simulation and move the imaginary ball back and forth in front of the sensor, you should see that the motors spin when the ball is far away, and if it gets too close to the sensor, so it's closer than that threshold variable, then I'm going to call the stop driving function and the motors will stop. When I move far enough away again, the motors will keep spinning. So it looks like everything is working fine, but there's actually a subtle problem here. And I want you to see if you can identify it just by looking at the code. Remember that we put delay commands inside some of our functions to make these behaviors happen for a certain amount of time. So for example, I call drive forward here with a delay of 1000 milliseconds. So it is going to pause for one second in this function before it goes back to the main loop and before it checks the condition in this if statement again. 
So stop and think about why that could be a problem. I'm going to run the simulation again to demonstrate this problem. Watch the motors carefully as I quickly move this object back and forth in front of the sensor. If you watch carefully enough, you will notice that the motors do not always stop right away when the object gets too close to the sensor, and this is because of that delay command in the drive forward function. The program is getting stuck here for a whole second before it checks this condition again to see if it needs to stop the motors. That's bad in this case because we would like to react to obstacles instantaneously. Now in case you couldn't see that, I'm going to make it way more obvious here by increasing this delay to a whole 10 seconds. So now if I start the simulation, you'll see my motors are spinning, and if I move the obstacle closer to the sensor, my motors are just going to keep spinning until that 10 second delay runs out. Clearly that would be very dangerous in the case of a real car that could potentially crash into an obstacle and hurt somebody. This is a lot more interesting to see with the physical car. I have this one programmed to drive forward and stop if it detects an obstacle closer than 20 centimeters in front of the sensor. However, it has a one second delay in the drive forward function. So we can see what happens if I aim it straight at this piece of cardboard and turn it on. It's almost like it has a delayed reaction time. It gets much closer than we want it to to the piece of cardboard before it actually stops. If we set that delay to zero, you can see how the car stops sooner. However, it's still not stopping at exactly 20 centimeters, and there are a couple different factors at play there. One is the accuracy of the sensor itself. If you go back to the video about the sensor, you will see how you can compare the actual physical distance measured with a ruler to the distance reported by the sensor with the Arduino serial monitor. However, even if your sensor is perfect and has an exact reading, your car still has momentum. It takes some non-zero amount of time for the motors and wheels to stop spinning and for the car to coast to a stop. The faster it's going, the longer it's going to take to stop, just like a real car. Now it's your turn to try this out. Run the program on your physical car and experiment with different delay values and different speeds for the motors. This will let you investigate where the car actually stops when it encounters an obstacle. This is also a good place to start thinking about your car, the environment it will be driving around in, and how you want to program its behavior. For example, do you think your car should always go full speed? What threshold distance do you want to set for detecting obstacles? And what will you actually do when you encounter an obstacle? Are you just going to sit there and wait for the obstacle to get out of the way? Are you going to turn around and drive in the other direction? Maybe just back up to make sure that you're a safe distance from the obstacle? or even try to use a series of turns to drive around the obstacle. All of those behaviors are up to you. The problem becomes more and more open-ended as you program your autonomous car. So, pause the video here and choose one of those behaviors to program, then try it out. For example, here's a program that has the car stop, turn around, then drive the other way. There's no right or wrong answer here. You can try experimenting with different behaviors.